Well, we have been looking at the Church of Philadelphia. If you're just joining us this week, we did something a little unusual last week. We stopped in the middle of the sermon and decided to complete it this week because there's some challenging uh, text here, and we wanted to take our time. We didn't want to rush through it. If you've been with us for any length of time, you've probably noticed that uh, the book of Revelation has been incredibly devotional for us, as it should be. Perhaps if you've grown up in the church and if you've studied Revelation, it, it has a tendency to be formulaic based on the particular eschatological system you, you ascribe to. And there seems to be a lot of questions and conversation about details and events and uh, timing and what certain things are and what symbols mean. And there is a time and a place for some of that. But the thrust of it is one of a, of a church. Literal churches in the first century, but also a church like ours. And how we are to persevere, how we are to overcome, how no matter what circumstances, trials, and tribulation may bring, and their coming, no matter what sort of persecution is on the horizon, no matter how difficult things will get, and they will, that by God's grace, churches persevere. True churches persevere. The grace that saves us is the grace that will persevere through us. Certainly there is a great apostasy coming. Certainly our culture is pressing in heavy on us. We're losing even family and friends. But true churches, true believers overcome, not by our own strength, but by the grace of God. And so as we look at this and we look at these churches, we're meant to look at these churches and take the warnings and take the encouragements. But ultimately, we are to learn how to persevere. That's the book of Revelation. And so last week, we got to the church in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, along with Smyrna, were the only two churches that what? They received no condemnation, only encouragement, only commendation, no correction. And like Smyrna, their persecution, their trials seemed to come more directly from, from the Jews rather than the imperial cult. And so as I mentioned, I think we're meant to look at Philadelphia and say, hey, this is a textbook example of the type of church we need to strive to be. Of the, of the type of church we need to strive to emulate. They may be small. Their influence may be insignificant. Their cultural pressures are real, and they seem to come from even family and friends being from the Jewish quarter. And yet they have a little power. And that's not a derogatory statement. They've got a little power that is opening doors by God's grace. Let me run through the first two points, and then we'll pick up where we left off in the middle of our third point. If you're taking notes, our, our first point was kingdom doorkeeper. Kingdom doorkeeper. Secondly, was an open door. Thirdly, where we left off, was vindication and preservation. And then finally, fellowship with the king. The key to this study was to understand that that church, the church of Philadelphia, so that we can better understand our church with a view to who Christ is, how to rightly advance his kingdom, how to trust in his sovereignty, and ultimately how to persevere to the end. Let me say that again. We want to look at this church and say, how can we emulate them? How can we see Christ rightly? How can we advance his kingdom faithfully? How can we trust in his sovereignty? And how can we persevere to the end? I'm going to jump back into these first two points and give us a recap. And then we'll pick up where we left off. Number one, kingdom doorkeeper. Look back at verse seven. 
And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens doors and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, dot, dot, dot. How do we see Christ rightly? Well, we have three adjectives here. He's one who is holy, who is true, and he holds the key of David. And what we said is that in, in, a, in a city that has a lot of opposition from the Jewish sector, these are very pregnant titles. The Messianic title, he is the Holy One of God. The Jews may say that they have the corner on truth, that the synagogue is the only way to the kingdom. But no, you serve a risen Savior. He is the Holy One of God. He is the true, the genuine Messiah, the one who is faithful. And he alone holds the key that opens the door that no one will shut. What is that door? That is the door to the celestial kingdom. That is the door to the new Jerusalem. The synagogue doesn't hold the keys to the temple. And even if it did, it's an earthly temple that has rejected their Messiah. It is Jesus Christ who holds the key to the door that no one can shut. And so the thought is this, that this little church in Philadelphia, this beleaguered, frustrated, tired, downtrodden church who, who feels like, are we really doing any good? The last 10 people I've witnessed to, nine and a half of them said no, and the other one said maybe just to be nice. You know? He's saying you rest secure in your citizenship. You rest secure that the truth that you heard, that you believed, actually has saved you. And it doesn't stop there. Look at our second point, an open door. Verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Okay, so there's that parallel statement. Because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. You are secure in your salvation. Christ has opened the door. But guess what? You also have an open door. And that same truth that saved you is the truth that you as a church get to proclaim. The, the, the picture is this. Rest assured that your Savior is the true Messiah. He has opened the door that you have been brought in by His grace. And that truth that saved you, you now have the privilege as ambassadors for him to say, come with. The door is open. A wide door of gospel opportunity. And this key of David that Jesus has, he's entrusted to the church. Remember we went to Matthew 16? 16? Christ asked Peter, who do people say that I am? He goes through it. Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you're right, Peter. And upon this rock will I build my church. Not upon you, Peter the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, but upon this truth, this foundation, that thou art the one true Christ, the Holy One of God, I will build my kingdom. How does Christ build his kingdom? One soul at a time through the gospel of Jesus Christ, spread by his ambassadors. He alone has the key that opens the door no one can shut, and he entrusts the keys to the kingdom to his church. We exercise the keys to the kingdom this morning. It's a binding and, flu and loosing uh, function. What we're doing is we're reflecting as best we can with finite minds and knowledge who believes? Who rejects? And so this is meant to be an encouragement because this little church that feels like they're not doing much good is assured. Look at your life. Look at what Christ has done in you. Your citizenship is real. Don't quit spreading the good news. You have a little power and it's working. And so you might think of this open door as, as kind of a, a double concept here. G.K. Beale says it this way. The open door refers not only to the church's salvation, but also to their witness to that salvation, 
which Christ has already begun to make effective in the community. This Philadelphian church, while small, is to be encouraged about their admission to the kingdom and encouraged to excel still more about proclaiming it to others. Because it is God who saves, right? Just a practical side note here. We were talking about areas of growth for 2023. I was talking with the elders and the deacons and the guys in the program. And I said, you know, our people, they, they love the Lord. They exercise the one of another's. They are passionate about the truth. They're very inviting. Where do we need to grow? I said evangelism. I don't think it's that we don't believe the word of God. I don't think it's that we don't believe the gospel. I don't even think it's that we don't witness. I think we do. But I do think that sometimes, if you're like me, you feel like it's a waste of time. Like it's just not going to work. That person just won't believe. I've talked to so many people and they just smile like I'm stupid. My family, well, they all say they're Christians, right? But I'm a little too serious of a Christian. And at Christmas time, they don't even really want to talk about Christ. And so it's like this King's X. I try to talk to them about Christ. Oh, but I've already got it. If I try to push, they don't want to hear it. And so you just get tired. Does anyone else get tired? You don't need to raise your hand, but you just get tired. This is reminding them that we don't convince people into the kingdom. We're seed sowers. God performs the miracle. He performed the miracle in your heart, in my heart, and mine was stony, okay? And if he was able to break my heart by his grace, causing the scales to fall from my eyes, for me to look upon whom I had pierced and believe, because God gave me the gift, the two-sided coin of repentance and faith, then how hard can my job really be? If he's left me here, cannot I just continue to sow the seed and let him cause the growth? That's the coaching encouragement. That's the, the word-fueled, chin-to-the-wind, open-door understanding that Philadelphia needs and that we need. Amen? But before he goes on, he encourages them with something else. Look at our third point. Vindication and preservation. Now, this is interesting because we don't talk about this in modern evangelicalism. But look at verse 9. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Philadelphia, because of your faithful witness, I will vindicate you before your enemies. You can imagine the beating this church's reputation took, especially if you were a converted Jew. You probably lost your business in the Jewish quarter. If your family still has you around, they talk behind your back. You, you serve a guy who claims to be a Messiah, but he was a, a felon, and he was executed. He committed treason. He was an insurrectionist. You can imagine what they feel like. Will their reputation ever be vindicated? Do they feel like they have to kind of carry this around? I've been done wrong in ministry, right? You know, they feel like that. And we talked about, hey, what's the biblical response? Leave it. Leave it. Christ will vindicate you. You don't need to nurse that grudge. In fact, it's sinful if you do. Leave it with him. Time and truth go together. And so he said, well, when did this happen? I, I, I want to know, what did it look like? Did all the Jews come before the church one day and say, we were wrong, we've shut the synagogue doors, and now we want to be part of the church? That's not what happened. And we start to see a transition in these letters with a view to the future. There's no sense that this happened then. But the promise will be fulfilled and they will be vindicated. Philippians 2.10, so that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But what does he tell them? They're not only going to confess every unbeliever that Jesus Christ is Lord, but they're also going to realize that Jesus loved you and that followers of Christ were right and that though their name was maligned and their career was taken from them and their kids were mocked, that they were right. So leave it. Trust. Let it go. Let Jesus be the judge. Let him handle it in the end. And that brought us to verse 10. He wants to fuel theirs and our endurance by assuring us of our spiritual survival. So why is that so important? Why is it so important now and why is it so important in the future? Well, I think if you had asked us that 20 years ago, why is it so important now, it would be hard for us to understand. But I think with what we're seeing in modern day evangelicalism, even from pastors and theologians, we are starting to see apostasy. We're starting to see people punt the faith. Now, not everyone says, I don't believe in this Bible or Jesus anymore, but they sort of redefine it in an Oprah Winfrey sort of way, right? Okay. And what's, what's the push from the outside? We said primarily it seems to be the issue of sexuality. You know, that's, that's the, the cultural pressure of the day. Everyone now seems to have a brother, a sister, a, an uncle, an aunt, or whatever else who is, claims to be homosexual, lesbian, transgender, binary, whatever, okay? And what before stood as God is righteous, he requires righteousness to have fellowship with us, our Lord Jesus Christ died, he lived the righteous life and died in our place and has imputed righteousness to us. Now we're starting to say, eh, I really like cousin so-and-so. I don't want to think ill of them, so I'm not going to think in those terms anymore. And they start to redefine Scripture. This has become normal. And now we also see things getting worse and worse. And it's clear that most Christians believe from Scripture that, that things aren't going to get better. And this brought us to verse 10, where he wants to fuel their endurance and ours by saying, you will spiritually survive. You will not punt the faith. I will keep you through to the end, and I will let nothing snatch you out of the palm of my hands, no matter how bad it gets spiritually, no matter how bad it gets physically. So now, in light of that, look at verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, because you have been faithful, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Because of your faithful witness, I will keep you from this hour of testing. And like with verse 9, this vindication of our enemies, this seems to have a future context. There's two phrases there. And by the way, if you'll allow me, I'm going to kind of go deep here for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I'll have us come up for air. I don't want to lose the devotion and the worship, but we've got a mini seminary class coming on right now. So be prepared. Uh, look at those two phrases, whole world and those who dwell upon the earth. Okay, if this was to happen in the present time, whole world, it, it didn't. So this seems to be a future context. The hour of testing that comes upon the whole earth, and that seems to point to the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls that we see from chapter 6 and forward. That's often called the Great Tribulation. This is a time when God's wrath is poured on an unbelieving world. It's poured out on unbelievers. That phrase, those who dwell upon the earth, in Revelation, is always referring to unbelievers. So now I'm going to give us some ground rules here. You ready? No matter what eschatological, that's doctrine of end times, no matter what eschatological position you take, it's a third tier issue. 
So what do you mean by third tier issue? Well, first tier is what all Christians believe in order to be saved. Trinity, virgin birth, atonement of Christ. You got it? Okay. Second tier. These are things that are important, but not essential to be a believer. Okay. These are things by which you choose fellowship, mode of baptism. Okay. Things like that. Third tier issue, issues. These are things we do not divide over. You like hymns, you like contemporary songs, great. You're not going anywhere. We're not letting you. It's a preference. You like green dividers, blue dividers, carpet, no carpet, get used to disappointment, okay? Eschatology is wonderful. Hear me. It's wonderful to have convictions, but we will not have divisions. If you come and say, I'm leaving the church because my eschatological position is so important, I can't fellowship with anyone else, I'm going to call you to repentance. My generation, not picking on y'all because y'all aren't that way, my generation was obsessed with this sort of stuff. They have the silly pre-trib conference once a year, five miles down the road. I want to show up and say, go disciple someone. Put your charts away. The purpose of Revelation is not to understand all the order of events. You can have a strong position on it. Take me out for a cup of coffee. Get me in the corner. We'll go round and round. We'll have a wonderful time. We're going to leave it in that booth when we leave. Okay? Those are the ground rules. Side note here, when I came here, came here in 2005, the order of events was actually in our doctrinal statement to our own shame. And we sat down as elders and we said, really? We're telling people they have to believe a certain eschatological position in order to be a member? We took that booger out. That was ridiculous. That said, there are things that all Christians agree upon. Jesus came in the flesh. The first advent, we celebrated that a few weeks ago. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. He came the first time as a suffering servant. He's coming the second time as a conquering king. He is coming back to rescue the righteous and judge the living and the dead. Everyone, every Christian agrees on that. The order or the timing of events we can disagree on. Most Christians, though, as I mentioned, believe that things are going to get worse. A few select believe they're going to get better, but I don't think they're studying as much as they should. Uh, things are going to get worse. Can we agree on that? I mean, you have to look out there. You can look at Scripture. Things are going to get worse. And what we see here in chapter 6 through 18 of Revelation, in this hour of testing, okay, is that the faithful church, the Philadelphia-type church that has kept his word, it says, and not denied his name, will be kept from this hour of testing. Let me say that again. The faithful church that has kept his word and kept his name will be kept from the hour of testing. All right? Here's the question. What does kept from mean? Does kept from mean to be kept out of the great tribulation or to be protected from or kept from the wrath? It really all depends on what the word that follows kept is. It's ek in the Greek. It means out, out of. So let's spend just a few moments. Let's look at it exegetically, and then we're going to look at it. Uh, we're going to look at past scripture. We're going to spend a lot of time on this in the future, so this is not exhaust exhaustive. Bear with me on this. We see the same phrase used elsewhere in the New Testament. 2 Peter 2.9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from ek, from out of temptation, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for this day of judgment. We see it even more clearly used in Christ's high priestly prayer, John 17. For I don't, do not ask you to take them ek out of this world, but to keep them ek from evil men. And that seems to fit the interpretation well. The whole thrust of the letters to these seven churches are to persevere, to overcome, to endure, to hold fast, we're going to see at the end of this text. But I want to review this prophetically up until this point. Are these issues talked about elsewhere in Scripture, not just Revelation? They are. 
And so what we need to do is not only understand this in context, but let's understand Christ's words. Let's understand Old Testament prophecy and let's understand Paul's words. Not so that you can come to a definitive position on something, but so that we can obey this text. Don't lose sight. This church is written, uh, this letter is written to the church of Philadelphia. A small church. It's discouraged, but they've been faithful. They've kept his word. Tough times are coming. What is he telling them that we need to understand? Another side note here. I would love one day when we stand before God to give him all the glory and grace and say, this church stood faithful. Really? How? Why did y'all do that? Did you just have some stellar people? Oh, it's because you're a great pastor. No, it's because God's grace is at work in us during the tough times to come as it has been at work in us in keeping his word and not denying his name. Does that make sense? That's, that needs to be our goal. All right, so let's look at it prophetically up to this point. I'm going to take us to two other places and normally don't flip around much, but we're going to do it this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Time is set in Passion Week. Christ is walking over to the Mount of Olives with his disciples. As they're walking, the disciples look back and they look at the Herodian temple. This is the temple, second temple period, that Herod takes 46 years in Roman, Roman money to build into one of the wonders of the world. It was magnificent. It was gleaming in the, in the sunlight. And they look at it and they're like, isn't that temple just beautiful? I mean, this is great. We're here with the Messiah. We're looking at the temple. We're going to the Mount of Olives. Does, does it get any better than this? And Christ just throws this wet blanket on them. And he says that that temple will be destroyed and not one stone will be left upon another. And they're flabbergasted. They're shocked. Look down at verse 3 of chapter 24. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It's like rapid fire questions. Boom, boom, boom. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming? When will be the end of the age? And we read that as 21st century Christians. They're like, wow, they got a lot of questions. They really don't. They really only have one question. And this, these, these three questions here are actually only two. It, it, it reads like this. What will be the sign of your coming and the end? Okay? What will be the sign of your coming and the end? That's, that's not when are you going to come back and set up your kingdom. There's no sense that Jesus was going to go away. And you have to understand from a Jewish perspective, they understood things in only two different ages. The present age and the age to come. The kingdom age. The present age and the age to come. The kingdom age. Who are they with? The king. What are they asking? The only, the only way things would be destroyed would be if he was ready, boom, to set up his kingdom. When are you going to set up your kingdom? When is this going to happen? Because that's the only time that things would, would go like this. The day of the Lord, that phrase in Jewish mindset was inextricably linked with the age to come, with the king setting up his kingdom, where he would, watch this, rescue the righteous and judge the wicked. Rescue the righteous and judge the wicked. So in their minds, this is not about going away and coming back, but it's about the king ushering in his kingdom. But we live on this side of the cross, don't we? And the fact is, Jesus did go away, and he is coming back. And the temple was destroyed. You historians out there, when was it destroyed? A.D. 70. The temple was destroyed by Titus Vespasian after the Jews rebelled. If you've ever been to, uh, to Rome, 
right around the Colosseum, there's Titus's arch celebrating his victory over the Jews where he destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the sanctuary, destroyed the city, took 97,000 of them, brought them back, many of whom became slaves and built the Colosseum. But Daniel predicts this 500 years earlier. So here's the thing. Matthew 24. Certainly, Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. But he's talking about more than that. Okay? What he's doing is he's talking to believers, telling them, don't be easily mistaken or shaken. When you start to see the signs of the end, realize the end is coming, but it's not here yet. It's going to get bad, but you need to endure. You need to be prepared because the end is coming, but it's not here yet. We as Christians could have learned that a little bit better, always thinking that the end is here. World War I, the Third Reich, right? Those are just signs. Those are birth pains. I don't want you to be misled, and I don't want you to be caught unprepared. These are birth pains. But you're going to know the end is here when, look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now see that phrase, abomination of desolation? It's in all caps. What does that mean? It means it's an Old Testament reference. He even tells us through Daniel the prophet. Hold, hold your hand there. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. The abomination of desolation. Something's going to happen. Temple's going to be destroyed. You're going to see the abomination of desolation. This seems to have been fulfilled in 168 B.C. You've heard me talk about Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay. Appearing of the Glorious One was his name. What did the Jews call him? Appearing of the Madman. And he was crazy. And he started a seven-year process of Hellenization where he made Jews become like Greeks. Horrible, terrible things he did. But the worst thing he did was called the Abomination of Desolation. Okay? 168 B.C. He killed a pig. He took out its guts. And he spread them in the Holy of Holies. He then made the priests eat the pig. He then took a statue of Zeus and he put it in the Holy of Holies. You follow me? He did the worst thing you could ever do. It was a, quote, willful, blasphemous, idolatrous desecration of worship intended for one purpose, to persecute God's people. Clearly, that was an abomination of desolation. Here's the question, though. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, so keep hanging with me for a minute. Was that the abomination of desolation? I don't think so. It was an abomination of desolation, but is it what Christ is ultimately looking forward to? I don't think so, because if you have time in your homework, read the rest of chapter 24 of Matthew, and Christ is talking about his coming, his return, okay? He's talking specifically about what will happen when he returns. Now look at Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 26. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Isn't that amazing that uh, Daniel prophesied this? And have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come, that's Titus Vespasian, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war and desolations are determined. Verse 27, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate, until even a complete destruction, one that is decreed and poured out on the one who makes desolate. Daniel prophesies the destruction of the city 500 years before it happens. 20, verse 26 seems to have happened. Verse 27 looks like it's in the future. Regardless, so wherever you stand on this, the abomination of desolation is a power grab 
It's Satan's sin. It's I will be like the Most High and I will desecrate anything that you use to worship God. Okay? Paul talks about this. This seems to be the future abomination of desolation. Listen to Paul as he writes, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, that's the apostasy of the church, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, I believe that's the beast, the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Revelation 13, then he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. It was also given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Turn back to Matthew and I'll bring it all together. To sum it this way, Christ is predicting the fall of Jerusalem. Christ is predicting the abomination of desolation. Someone who will desecrate the sanctuary for the purpose of pers uh, persecuting God's people. That happened in AD 70 and then in 168, or 168 BC and then in AD 70, okay? But he seems to be pointing to the abomination of desolation that will happen in the future, not the one that has happened in the past. Look at verse 21, chapter 24 of Matthew. For there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world, world up until now, nor ever will. What did we just read in Revelation 3? An hour of testing that will come upon the whole world. Daniel 12 talks about it as well. Such as a time that has never happened, and yet everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. What do all Christians believe? Christ is coming again as he came the first time. He's coming back as a conquering king. Things are going to get worse. They're going to get really, really bad. There's going to be an hour of testing that comes upon the whole earth. Those who have kept my name and kept my word will be kept from this hour of testing. What does that mean? Turn back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. The most normative reading of the text in understanding this is that the church is to be kept through, kept in the midst of, protected through this hour of testing. How do we know this? Not only all that we've read, but also what does it say? Hold fast, overcome, persevere. G.K. Beale again explains this is protection rather than exemption from the trial. The church that has maintained a faithful witness when the hour of testing comes will be protected through. Will be, watch this, spiritually protected through. All of this is said in the context of Jesus as the Messiah, the Holy One of God, the true Messiah holds the key that no one can open and no one can shut except for him. The key to the new Jerusalem. He is encouraging this church. They will be spiritually protected no matter how bad things get. And I think in some cases, some cases, we're going to be physically protected. I don't know exactly how, but it seems normative in the same way that God protected the Israelites from some plagues that affected only the Egyptians. We see pictures of that with the 144,000 Jews who've been sealed will be protected from the locusts. Now we're going to get into all this in the, in the few months, but this is part of our preparation. We can't study Revelation and have it mean nothing, right? Side note here, a second or a third secret coming of Christ did not come about until the 1800s. That, that concept, okay? Are we going to be protected from the wrath to come? Yes, but wrath is clearly judgment. We're going to be protected from God's wrath. But yet there's going to be martyrs. 
So that clearly doesn't mean physically protected. We're not going to be protected from Satan's wrath, but we, we will be protected from God's wrath. That wrath has already been put on Christ at the cross. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not life, nor death, nothing, not tribulations. And yet, as I mentioned, there will be times where we will be protected, I think, physically. We don't need to figure all that out. But the purpose of this is he's ensuring them that they will not fall away. As they have been faithful by God's grace. As they, as they have kept his name by God's grace. So by God's grace, he will keep them through even the difficult time that is coming. You with me? Let's look at our last point. Fellowship with the king. That verse, 310, is nested in the power of the Messiah. The power of the Messiah to seek and save those whom he has chosen, whom the Father has chosen. Look at verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes... I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of my city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Only those who persevere, which we believe that this Philadelphian church will persevere, they will receive the crown of life. But look at what they're promised. There's like four bullet points here. A pillar in the temple. The name of God written on him. The name of the new Jerusalem written on him. And Jesus' new name. And you're like, what is John doing? Is he just kind of getting eloquent here and just writing a bunch of things? No. I, I want you to think about this. Go back to the Philadelphian church. What had following Christ cost them? What did it cost them? Family, friends, reputation, stability, affection, belonging, monetary cost. Watch what he is promising them as those who have been brought through the door, the door of salvation. A pillar in the temple. What's the, what's the last thing standing after an earthquake? Pillars, right? What are the things that hold up the temple, pillars. A pillar is stability. They are immovable. You know, what's interesting is that the city of Philadelphia had a massive earthquake in AD 17. The great historian Strabo writes about how the buildings had cracks in the walls and that tremors were frequent uh, for, for months and years to come that many people moved outside the city because they could not live inside the city because there was no stability. This is what they're used to. And he says, no, no, no. You can rest assured there is stability in Christ. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Everyone in the ancient Near East understood this, especially Jews. When Solomon built his great temple, I think it was 931, he took two of the pillars and he gave them names. Did you know that? One of them was named Boaz. In him is strength. That's what Boaz means. The other one was named Jachin. Jachin means he establishes. The Jewish synagogue would have said they were the direct line. They were the stability towards the temple. Christ is saying, nah. -uh. He says, read ahead. I'm the temple, and I will make you a pillar in my temple. Secondly, the name of God was written on them. Not only do they have stability, but they have identity. Christ says, I own you. I purchased you. You're one of mine. You get to wear the family colors. The crest is yours. They belong. And the name of the new Jerusalem, that's citizenship. That's where they're going. They're not citizens of Philadelphia. They've been rejected by this town. They've been rejected by the synagogue. When they kicked them out of the synagogue, they took their names and they marked them out of the book and they closed the doors behind them. But what is Christ offering them? An open door with citizenship in the new Jerusalem. And finally, Jesus' new name 
Revelation 19, 12 says, His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. When you say you're going to have Jesus's new name, Jesus's new name means no one has power over him. In the Jewish world, to give someone a name, you had power over them. No one knows this name but Jesus. He says, I'm it. I'm the most powerful. I am the God of very God. I'm going to give you my name. Schreiner explains, no one holds power or sovereignty over Jesus. Having Jesus' name means believers belong to Jesus and are protected by his love and power. So Metro family, the church in Philadelphia, this is our go-to text. This is what we need now and in the months and years to come. We need to cast aside the metrics of worldly success. We need to hold fast to his word and hold fast to his name like the Philadelphia church so that he will hold fast to us and keep us in this hour of testing. How do we do this? We continue to sow seeds. We continue to impart the word and our lives to others. We make disciple making disciples. We may have a little power, but it is his power. And it is his power that saved us and his power that will save others. And it is his power that will save us and others to the end. Does that make sense? And when you get discouraged, Know that he who began a good work in you will complete it. Rest that one day you will be vindicated. Know that the wrath will not ever affect you because it has already been set upon Jesus' shoulders. The hour of testing is for the unbeliever. We may be collateral around it, okay? But we are as secure as if we were in heaven. He will keep us through the difficult time, and one day we will be admitted through that door to the new Jerusalem. Safe, secure, stable, and in fellowship with the King. Amen. Amen.